In section 7-2 of the text, we learned how to create a confidence interval for a population's proportion. Now, we're going to talk about how to create a confidence interval for a population's mean. Please recall that both proportion and mean are what we call unbiased indicators. That are the, They are reliable indicators, information we get from a sample that we, we can rely on to be fairly close to those corresponding values for the entire population. The third reliable indicator, recall, was the sample variance. All right, how do we form this confidence interval for a population's mean? Well, first of all, let's talk about some of the symbols we'll be using. Please recall that a, a population mean is represented by the Greek letter mu and the population standard deviation I'm going to abbreviate that standard deviation is represented by the Greek letter sigma lowercase sigma well hopefully you recall that in order to find a confidence interval we need to start with a point estimate from the sample and the point estimate that we use from the sample to find a population's mean is the sample mean so recall that the the symbol for the sample mean is x bar and the symbol that we use for the sample standard deviation is just s so here's four symbols, a lot of symbols in this. Please, please know your symbols. Make flashcards if you have to, with the symbol on one side and the, the meaning on the other. But you, you really need to, to, to learn the symbols, especially in this chapter. All right, we know that in order to form a confidence interval, we have to first come up with the margin of error. And the margin of error is represented by just the letter uppercase E. And our formula to find the margin of error is E equals Z sub alpha over 2, some critical value, times the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, this part should look familiar. You should all recognize this from the earlier chapter as simply being the standard deviation of the distribution of, of all sample means. This part right here. So once again, this is simply, we're going to go out in either direction, this many standard deviations. Okay? So... What we'll be doing, we'll be starting with this case with x bar with the sample mean. We have to we have to base this this interval on something, and we base it on the information we get from the sample, the sample mean, and we're gonna add to it the margin of error to get my upper end, and we're gonna subtract from it the margin of error to get my lower end. And we know that from here to here. This is my confidence interval, and we're claiming at a high, at a high level of confidence, usually something in the 90% range, something in the 90s, that we're pretty sure that at the actual population mean mu is someplace in this interval. Don't know exactly where, but we're pretty sure it's someplace in here. Our goal is to make this interval a reasonably small interval, that is, make this margin of error as small as we can reasonably make it, so that we have really zeroed in on the actual value from mu. Now, there is a problem. Here's the problem. Is it likely, if we're trying to find the population mean, or at least an interval for the population mean, is it likely that we will, ahead of time, know this population standard deviation? I mean, don't we normally calculate the standard deviation after we know the mean? But notice my formula for E 
requires that we know the population standard deviation. We're not going to know that. We're not going to know it. So what are we going to do? Well, what it really means is we, we can't use this formula. That's too bad because it's really simple and it uses z-scores. We already knew about z-scores. We need a new formula. Okay? So, what's the new formula? Let me show you. The new formula will be this. The margin of error E can be calculated by taking a new critical value that we're going to call T sub alpha over 2. And we're going to multiply it times a fraction. But the numerator is not going to be the population standard deviation. It's going to be some standard deviation that we know. And what do we know? Well, we're going to know the samples standard deviation. So we'll put S there. And we're still going to divide it by the square root of the sample size. Okay. So this is the formula we're going to be using now. Slightly different than what I wrote earlier and crossed out. What exactly is T sub alpha over 2? Let me explain that. Please recall that Z sub alpha over 2 had four specific values based on whether we were talking about a confidence level of 90%. That's the, that was what it was for 90%. Or for 95%. Or 98%, not skipping any. Uh, let me do them in order. 90%, 95%, yeah, 1.96. For 98% was 2.33. And for 99%, which is 2.575. We typically just use these four because we typically use just four uh, confidence levels. For, for T sub alpha over 2... There are not just four values. There are hundreds of critical values to choose from. Hundreds. Well, what is it based on then? All right. T sub alpha 2 is based on, just like, just like Z sub alpha 2, it's based on a confidence level. The same four confidence levels. Okay. But for each one of these confidence levels, we can also, it's also based on the number of degrees of freedom. Now, you probably don't remember what the degrees of freedom is, so let me go through this again. This was mentioned earlier in the quarter, but you may have forgot. The degrees of freedom, at least for this uh, beginning statistics class, the degrees of freedom is simply the size of your sample minus 1. That's the degrees of freedom. In different applications, the degrees of freedom can be a number other than this, but for right now, it's just n minus 1. These are the two things that T sub alpha 2 is based on. And since there are 100 of possibilities, how do we possibly remember all those? Well, we don't have to remember all those. We have a table. If you look in your tables, if you look at specifically table a-3, you'll see that it's called the distribu T distribution critical T values. This is a little hard to read, so I've blown it up. Let me uh, show you just pieces of it. Here's the top part of the table blown up. Hopefully this is going to be readable. And let's talk about what we have. Across the top, we have two headings. One heading is called area in one tail, and the other heading is called area in two tails. In my next video, I am going to explain how to use this table and what it all means.